Okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, my name is Kara Golrap, and this is what's new in WCAG 2.1. So I am a front-end developer at Message Agency, and I also oversee our web accessibility initiatives there. Message Agency is a full-service digital agency in Philadelphia. We're a certified B Corporation, working with nonprofits, universities, foundations, government, and other mission-aligned for profits. Uh, Message Agency is a social enterprises that helps nonprofits to use technology to enlighten, educate, engage, and enact change. So a little bit of background on me. For the last 10 years, I worked primarily in the education technology space. In the past, I developed digital literacy curriculum for students with learning disabilities and designed a learning platform that focused on adult literacy and English language learning. So with a personal mis uh, mission to create an inclusive web, I'm an accessibility advocate and I'm here to help you guys fight the good fight. So I'd like to give you guys a little bit of an outline um, of how this session's gonna uh, go. Um, if at any time you guys have any questions, you know, don't feel like you have to wait till the end. You can raise your hand if you need me to clarify anything or expand on anything. Um, definitely want this to be more of a conversation. So we'll start with a quick overview. Um, then we'll go into uh, who was the focus of the WCAG 2.1. We'll also answer the question of how does this affect me? Uh, how long do I have? And then we'll get into the breakdowns and additions and what's new in WCAG 2.1. So real quick, uh, what is web accessibility? Uh, in our physical world, we understand why we have things like ramps to buildings uh, and at sidewalk crossings. We understand why signs have braille and why doors have push plates. It's to provide access to areas, information, and functionality that any given person may need. So web accessibility is an extension of that, of that and those considerations. It's a set of best practices and guidelines that reduces or removes the barrier to entry. It's used to ensure that all users have equal access to information and functionality. So where do these standards and guidelines come from? They come from the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C, which is led by the inventor of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, and he has this great quote. The power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So the W3C, for those of you who don't know, is an international organization that sets protocols and guidelines for ensuring the long-term growth of the web. Um, inside the W3C is the Web Accessibility Initiative, which published the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, or WCAG. Um, and they did the first draft 1.0 in 1999. Uh, 2.0 was released in 2008, and then last year they published 2.1, which is what we'll be talking about today. So the art guidelines are broken into four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, or poor for short. So I'll give a quick overview of um, you know, what's changed. Um, in WCAG 2.1 and what hasn't changed. So uh, the WCAG 2.1 is an extension of the WCAG 2.0. So everything that was in 2.0 is still in 2.1 with the same numbering system. Um, it's also the WCAG 2.1 is backwards compatible. Um, if your content conforms to 2.1, it also conforms to 2.0. Uh, in terms of structure, the WCAG 2.1 still follows the same levels of compliance, so level A, level AA, and level AAA. So WCAG 2.1 is an official W3C recommendation. And then for those of you who don't know what a W3C recommendation is, uh, it's, it's a web standard. Um, so much like how a bill becomes a law, uh, for something to become a web standard or uh, web recommendation goes through a very rigorous process. So we're not going to go over this chart at all, um, but it's important to keep in the back of your minds that in order for something to become a, recommend, a recommendation, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of people, uh, both from, they both get public uh, input, they also get uh, subject matter expert input, and there's a lot of review to ensure that these technical decisions are of the utmost quality and fairness to all users. 
So also, um, one thing that has changed is full page conformance requirement now includes all variations across all breakpoints. Um, the good news is if your site ha already has a responsive framework um, embedded, so if you use something like Bootstrap, you're probably already meeting this, but um, it's important now that everything that has to, across all breakpoints, um, in order to meet this full page conformance requirement, just everything, all breakpoints, all screens, mobile, tablet, desktop. So who is the focus of the WCAG 2.1? So um, they focus primarily on folks with cognitive and learning disabilities. Also, people who have low vision and senior citizens, and then mobile device users. And very important, how does this affect me? So are you updating your accessibility policies? The W3C recommends that organizations adopt WCAG 2.1 when they are looking to update or create accessibility policies. Uh, in addition, some organizations may require WCAG 2.1 conformance from third parties and vendors. So for these organizations, um, adherence to WCAG 2.1 um, might be critical to ensure compliance with applicable requirements. Um, also, are you working with or organizations with requirements? Um, are you redesigning a site in the near future? So you really want to think about longevity because um, with some of these new, um, with some of these new additions, um, things like non-text contrast. Usually, the um, previously the contrast used to just relate to text contrast, but now we have things where all of our elements and icons and infographics now have to meet the same contrast minimums, and that could affect design assets. So also, are you auditing a site? Um, I personally like to think of accessibility audits as roadmaps. So if you are um, so if you are doing one, I would do it against 2.1 because there are things that you might have to change anyways. Um, I also did, um, so I did my first audit um, against 2.1 and excluding the whole like the first time takes the longest piece. Um, it will absolutely take you longer because now since we're including every breakpoint, it requires you know us testing on different devices like smartphones and tablets. So how long do I have? So it really depends and I wish I had a better answer for you than that, but um, Right now, at the time of this presentation, most laws like Section 508 and various international laws only require your site to be 2.0 compliant. But this could vary by state, sector, or institution. Um, some organizations plan for the future in their accessibility standards. Uh, for example, California's government uh, website requirements indicate that vendors can use WCAG 2.0 or the latest version of WCAG, which is 2.1. Um, so in short, how long you have will be inconsistent across states and institutions, so some due diligence is a must. And then also 3.0 or silver, um, which will be the next big release of, um, of the WCAG, that's due out in 2021. So while 2.1 probably won't be written into law, all of these new additions will find its way into 3.0, so you might as well start planning for the future today. So now we'll get down into breakdowns and additions. So I've arranged the slides to go in order of their numbering with the exception of the additions um, to level AAA. Um, I added them to the end of this presentation um, so that we'll go over if, um, if we have time to. Um, I would rather spend that time on questions, but I'm, but I'm a fast talker, so we'll, we'll likely get through everything. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the first one is um, 1.3.4 orientation, and it's a level AA requirement. It says that sites can be used in both portrait and landscape orientations. So some users can't change um, or can't easily change the orientation of their web devices. So we should ensure that our sites can be used both in portrait and landscape orientations. Along with those who have their devices mounted in a fixed orientation, this success criterion also helps uh, folks with low vision um, since changing the content's orientation often increases um, the content's text size. 
The one exception of this um, would be when a specific display orientation is essential. So the WCAG gives the example of a, bank, uh, a mobile banking app. If you guys have ever deposited a check through a mobile app, that is, um, you usually have to hold it in a landscape orientation because checks are landscape. So that would be something that would be considered essential. Um, but like I said, great news. If you already have a responsive framework on your website, you're probably already needing this. So the next one is 1.3.5, identify input purpose, which is another level AA um, addition. We should help browsers automatically fill out our forms. Um, I'm sure all of you guys love it when you go to fill out a form and all of, all of the correct information automatically loads right into the form. Um, and we can do these sorts of things by using the HTML autocomplete attribute, which for developers in here looks like this. We have autocomplete and then if you go to um, whether you go to like the W3 schools um, or, the, or Mozilla's um, website where they have all of the different HTML elements, you can find a super handy list that has all that. I've also linked that in this presentation. So things like this are super helpful for people who have dexterity disabilities, um, who have trouble typing, users with language, memory, or executive function related disabilities. Um, and because those folks may require more time to process information or directions asked of them. And this also benefits literally anyone who hates filling out forms. So the next one is 1.4.10 reflow, which is another level double I addition. Your site and its element, basically it says your site and its elements must be responsive. It says that content can be presented without loss of information or functionality. Um, without requiring the scrolling in two dimensions for vertical scrolling at a width equivalent to 320 CSS pixels. Um, so if you have, so your smartphone, it's, that's typically your, um, your, how, um, your resolution for that. Um, also horizontal scrolling content at a height equivalent to 256 pixels. Um, also users should be able to zoom in up to 400% on desktop browsers. So. This is another um, where a place where a responsive framework really helps. So here you can see if you're on a desktop site, um, this is one of our client sites. If you zoom in 400%, you end up at the at our mobile um, view because it collapses because that's the way that it collapses. Um, this also goes into you want to make sure that um, if you have your things like a mobile menu and if you have things that are specifically for mobile, you want to make sure that people on desktops can also still use that functionality. So see here, desktop, zoom, 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 we collapse into mobile. So I touched on this one a little bit in the beginning of our slides, but the next one is non-text contrast, um, which is a level double A. So now you have to have proper, you have to meet proper color contrast minimums for everything. Um, so elements like buttons, icons, and things like infographics now have to meet these minimums. This also includes elements, hovers, and focus states as well. So, this infographic, while it is you know, designed pretty well, it's kind of hard to read and it definitely doesn't meet your contrast minimums. So you'll definitely want to use your bolder colors and um, if you, whether you're putting it to, uh, you know, your infographics together or your flow charts or your graphs or any of that together, or if you have a designer, you need to start um, testing all of those colors against um, minimums. So the next is text spacing. It's another level double I. Um, users must be able to increase text properties without losing content or functionality. The WCAG says that um, your content should be able to be adjusted to a line height to at least one and a half times the font size. Space below paragraphs to at least two times the font size. Letter spacing to at least 0.12 the font size or word spacing to at least 0.16 the font size. And this could be a little hard to test for, um, but this guy, uh, Steve Faulkner, has a great text uh, spacing bookmarklet um, on CodePen that you can do a quick and dirty test for. I've linked that in the presentation, but a, a quick demo of this is, this is a site without, um, you know, without any of those text spacing considerations. 
I run the bookmarklet, and you can see that now all of the um, all of the text has changed. So if you're unable to change some of these text properties, and it would probably be because your CSS locked it down with a, you know with an important flag, um, you'll want to make sure that you remove those things. So the next is content on, um, on hover or focus. Uh, in recent years, a, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, a common trend on certain websites is to display a pop-up, um, typically asking you to sign up for a newsletter when you hover or tab over a certain piece of content or when you go to X out of the screen. Um, if there are areas on your site that when new content appears, um, if a user hovers or tabs over an element, you need to ensure that that content can be dismissed um, without moving their pointer or tab onto some other element, um, that the content will not disappear if the user moves their mouse over it, and that the content remains visible until the hover or focus trigger is removed. The user dismisses it or the content is no longer valid. Um, this lets users who increase um, the size of their mouse cursor or, um, or users who have low pointer accuracy see content unobscured or easily dismiss unintentionally triggered additional content. Uh, this also grants users who have cognitive disabilities adequate time to perceive additional content that appears on the screen. So yes, it must be um, dismissible without moving their pointer or tab onto some other element visible if they move their mouse over it, and visible until it's removed. So our next is character key shortcuts. It's a level A edition. So one keyboard, um, one key keyboard shortcuts must have, additional, um, must have additional abilities or must be able to be remapped. So I'm not sure if you guys use, an example of that is, I'm not sure if you guys use Jira at all, but if you do, um, if you're, for instance, if you're on a ticket and you want to log work or a time log on it, you click the W button. So if your website supports keyboard shortcuts that only use one key, um, including upper and lowercase letters, punctuation, numbers, um, or symbol characters, um, then at least one of the following must be true. You must have the ability, uh, someone must have the ability to turn these off. Um, they must have the ability to remap these, car um, these keyboard shortcuts. Um, they also have to have the ability to only be active when the component has focus. Um, and, this, and we need this because users who have a permanent or temporary dex uh, dexterity limitation may be prone to accidentally hitting keys. Um, having the ability to turn off these shortcuts or modify them to include another character would cut down on accidentally triggering these shortcuts. Um, speech users um, who also want to use these single key shortcuts, they would need to be turned off so they can avoid accidentally firing a batch of them all at once. So the next one is our pointer gestures, which is a level, uh, level A. So multi-touch gestures must be able to be completed by a single gesture. For those of you who have an iPhone, an example of that would be if, I, if I'm in my uh, photo app, I can zoom in on a picture by either spreading my two fingers apart or I can perform the same action by double tapping where I want to zoom in. Um, so, and this is super important for um, folks with limited motor skills. Um, having a simple way to perform complex gestures is essential for um, these types of people. So the next is pointer cancellation. It's another level A addition. Um, have you guys ever like, uh, written an email or filled out a form, and then when you pressed um, on the send button, you're like, oh my god, I really didn't mean to send this, and then you try and drag the arrow away to cancel it out, and like the email still sends anyways? So this would alleviate um, and totally take away that type of anxiety-inducing situation. So what this means now is down events cannot be used to complete a function. So with this, uh, so with this success criterion, you, um, you would have to be able to cancel out that function by either, drag, um, either dragging their pointer um, or finger away from the button. 
So the next is label and name, level A. Um, visible labels need to match their accessible names. Um, this success criterion is a huge win for speech input and text-to-speech users. Text that appears on a form control or an image must match how the HTML identifies the form control or image. We do this through proper semantic HTML using the label uh, element, um, alt or aria labeled by attributes. Also, our visible labels must match its accessible name or, or programmatic label. Um, when we do this, uh, users can activate, um, these users who are using either text-to-speech or voice input um, can activate controls easier. When we don't do this, we create a, frus a frustrating experience for users when they say a visible text label, but the speech input doesn't work because the accessible name doesn't match. So here, if you, if, um, I have a teapot and a coffee maker and it both says buy, but if I'm saying, well, buy what, does the, um, it might, the assistive technology might not recognize that, but so we make that a little easier by saying buy teapot, buy coffee maker. So the next is motion actuation. It's a level, um, it's just a level A addition. So your website's not a shape weight, so you cannot rely fully just on motion gestures to complete a task. Um, and if you do have a website or an app that a motion gesture, like shaking a phone um, sometimes uh, on apps, I think on iPhones, deletes the text, you must have another way to do that. So here, you can either shake to delete or you can just simply delete by hitting a button. So next is status messages. It's a level double A edition. You must alert the user, but you don't want to interrupt them. There's a lot of reasons why we want to alert, um, we want to alert users on the status of what they're doing. Sometimes it's because um, there's an error on the form that they just filled out or that they successfully added an item to their cart. Um, Sometimes it's also to let them know where they are in a process if they're filling out maybe a multi-step form. When we alert users of these things, we need to make sure that their assistive technologies are alerted as well, but we're not, inter but we're not interrupting the user by forcing them onto another element or to putting them on a new page. By using the appropriate ARIA roles for these messages, we can ensure all of those things. So we'll want to use role status for results of an action, like successful form submissions, role alert or ARIA live assertive to identify errors like um, an incorrect value on a form. I've also started using ARIA live regions on some of our, um, if we had, on some of our sites have pretty in-depth um, like search functionality and a lot of, um, I know a lot of uh, people now use the Ajax reloading, so when we do that, our pages don't reload. So if I, you know, if I'm a sighted user, I can obviously see that new, um, new results have loaded. But if you use an ARIA live region, it'll alert assistive technology. So somebody who's using a screen reader, it could say something like, New results loaded, 25 visible, sorting from price high to price lowest. So it gives additional context um, to people who are using assistive technology. We can also use the role progress bar to let users know where they are in a process. So again, if you're filling out a, um, a multi-step form, you could use the role progress bar for the indicators at the top. So we'll be getting into our level triple A additions. Um, this one is identify purpose. Our HTML um, should provide context, purpose, and meaning. So um, for example, users who have a cognitive disability might find it difficult to concentrate on sections of it, um, if there are many sections of a page present. So if, we, if our sites use ARIA landmarks uh, to identify regions of a page, so whether it's um, you know, navigation or our sides or our main content, um, this would allow users um, to have their assistive technology hide all the regions that weren't marked main. Uh, this goes uh, pretty hand in hand with the W3C's personalization semantics, which is an exciting initiative in itself. Um, but something like this could look like um, they have a great little demo site where, so let's say this is our, um, our online store. 
Uh, an assistive technology, what it could do is if I have trouble concentrating, if there's lots of areas on the page, I can alert my assistive technology like, hey, like, clear out all the crap I don't need. And then it would make it a, um, it would transform it or hide the things that I really, that I don't need at that time. So it's simplifying navigation and focusing on a contact form. Are you saying there is assistive technology that does that? No? Yes, there. Um, sir, it's it's more so for um, for folks who have cognitive disabilities. Um, you know, whether it's ADHD, um, you know, or maybe a certain type of autism. But it's a way for um, sometimes people have a hard time processing if there's a lot of information on a page so they have the ability you so know it's a tool that could be added to a browser or something like that yeah it can um they so they in this example they use um they use a json to do that um but it can be implemented uh, a number of different ways um what you know maybe it's through a bookmarklet um kind of like that space that text spacing tool that i showed you guys um but it can be implemented in other ways but there are there is uh, some stuff out like out there like that now. So the next one is timeouts. Uh, it's another level AAA. So store the user's data for 20 hours or warn the user in the beginning um, that it will be timed out. If there's a timeout on any part of your site, you either have to store the user's data for 20 hours or at the beginning of the process, warn the user that they have a specific amount of time. Um, under the success criterion, the WCAG makes a call out that I will also echo here. Um, there is a, so this is a lot of legal mumbo jumbo. Um, I'm a developer, so I'm not going to pretend I know everything in this. But basically, what it says is um, if you're not sure, just call a lawyer. Um, there might be certain things um, that you might not be privy to. Um, so, you know, if the user is a minor, um, explicit consent might be, you know, may not be solicited in most jurisdictions. So if you're unsure, if you're using, if you're using timeouts on, on any part of your site and you're not sure, um, you know, if you're gonna meet this and you also have to meet le uh, level AAA um, conformance, you'll probably wanna consult with the lawyer. Yes? Is there typically a minimum on um, how long for the timeout for accessibility purposes? Um, I thought originally it was like 24 hours or something like that. I think that was one, but it was another level AAA, which most, I mean, I've never met somebody who was at an organization where they had to meet level AAA um, conformance, but I know there are some out there, but I'm pretty sure the time I was like, was like something like 24 hours. Oh, yeah. So the next one is animations from interactions. Um, so motion animation triggered by interaction can be dismissed. Um, and then of course, unless the animation is um, essential to the information being conveyed. So imagine that you have a web app um, that lets you create an animation scene. Um, you would then need to provide the animation that you created. So in this case, um, this part of the app that lets you preview the, informa um, the information, the animation, that would be considered essential. So motion animations, um, like the parallax effect that I know that's uh, super popular in website design. Um, and then also when you're scrolling down a page, you have some like your fancy SVGs moving around. So things like that um, can, can be pretty problematic for uh, folks that have um, inner ear disorders um, or also who um, get motion sickness easily. So the impact of these animations on, on users with um, this, these inner ear disorders um, can range from dizziness, uh, nausea, or um, trouble, um, trouble walking to distractions, um, to distractions, migraines, and, like, and even needing bed rest. Um, though there is limited browser support right now, there, um, there is a media query that we could use, um, prefers reduced motion. Um, that we can basically write into our CSS and then disable that animation for those who find that these types of animations um, pretty distracting. Um, I know with like iPhones they have that. If you go, in, I believe it's in your accessibility settings, but uh, things like uh, it reduces the animation when you're switching between apps. It also um, 
does it also gives you a little bit more uh, background color so things aren't as transparent so that uh, so that setting would go hand in hand with this media query um, and then just a quick note that um, animations from interactions applies when a user's interaction initiates non-essential animation so in contrast um, the one 2.2.2 pause, stop, and hide applies when the website initiates animation. So the next one is target size. Uh, so buttons um, and other interactive components need to be at least 44 pixels by 44 pixels. Um, have you guys ever tried to tap on a forum button or like close um, or hit the close icon on our modal just for your finger to be too big and then you can't actually do anything? So fear no more. Um, this, uh, this level AAA edition would totally erase that. And then the next one is concurrent input mechanisms. So our devices allow us to interact with them in a plethora of ways, uh, especially when we use different accessories like a stylus or connect input devices like a keyboard to them. Uh, websites should allow users to switch between these modalities. So for example, if I'm filling out a form on your website through voice input, I should be able to just turn off my voice input and then continue filling out that form with a keyboard um, as an example. So we covered a bunch of stuff. So it is now time for questions if you guys have any. Yes? Do you have any websites that would uh, serve as a good example for the implementation of like level 2A or level uh, AAA? Um, level AA on most government websites. Um, I know if you go to the US, the United States and then also um, the United Kingdom uh, website, they both have really great design systems in place uh, and they have websites about their design systems. So if you're a government agency or if you receive any type of federal funding, you have to meet level uh, AA. So most of those websites would be good examples, but I would recommend going to, and I think it's in our resources, um, I think it's in our for designers, yeah, the US design system. I would definitely go check that out um, because they spent a lot. They spent a lot of time uh, trying to make accessible components, but also make them look nice. Um, that was a big thing that I would always hear from my designers. It's like, well, okay, we hear all this stuff about accessibility, but we don't want to make ugly websites. So being accessible doesn't mean you have to be ugly. Um, in terms of level AAA. Um, I don't know of one off the top of my head because I know those institutions are pretty rare. Um, but I know if you Google a level AAA website, there is one of like the first results is like is an example of a few of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. For the one you went over for two point one point four, the single key shortcuts, mm -hmm. was that you need to meet all three of those, or you need to meet one of them? Uh, you need to um, you need to meet one of them. So you can either somebody has to be able to like turn them all off or remap them or so they just basically you just need to provide somebody some other way uh, to do that. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Yes. Can you recommend any tools for the auditing of our website? Yes, absolutely. So um, I have some resources here. Um, so you can get some great stuff um, right in your browser. Um, like the Wave Chrome and Firefox extensions are really good. Um, Google and Firefox also now have, um, or at least I know I, I use, I've switched over uh, to Firefox. So I know they have um, built-in accessibility tools um, in their in their dev tools. Um, there's also the W3C, they have a markup validation service. So you just type, uh, you put in a link to your website and I'm pretty sure it only does it, um, this one only does it like page by page. So it's a bit manual, but it will validate your HTML. Um, I also use, let's see, and then we have a contrast checker. Um, and I personally use for auditing, this is a pretty good one, the WCAG EM report tool. So what this does is um, if you're not really sure how to evaluate websites or if you're looking into getting into auditing or you're just kind of curious about how somebody would go about that, this is a, this is a pretty, pretty good tool. Let's see if I can pull it up and do this live. Let's 
It's like I have no color contrast here, so I'm like, where is everything? But I can't, it looks like I can't switch it over, but I'd be happy to show you guys this tool. What it does is um, it walks you through step by step um, how somebody would go about that. And then at the end of it, it, uh, it just ge it generates an HTML and a PDF file for you. So it's pretty cool. But everything from de um, defining the scope, um, your conformance target, um, you put in links to, let's say, um, like different, if you have different content types, so if you have like landing pages, like a blog post page and all these other ones, like you put in um, links to them and then what it does is it walks you through each of the success, uh, success criterion and then you can say, okay, passed, failed, wasn't present, not sure, and it helps you put together a report. Um, so in terms of auditing, I found this a really great way for at least me to start familiarizing myself with what that looks like. Can you, oh. Oh, go ahead. Can you differentiate whether you want double A AA or triple A? Yes, you can, yeah. It's so whether it's like level A, level double A, level triple A, and then it'll pull in all of those success criteria for you to test your links against. So that'd be something that you could hand over to your, to your developer who'll be able to go through and fix whatever's Yes, yes, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, and I wish I could change my screen, <laughs> but um, what it does is, yeah, you put in all, like, the links to your different pages, um, and it generates a really great report for you in a multi, in, you know, in a lot of different forms, so whether it's, like, a PDF, HTML, um, and a few others, it's, you know, you can just download the file right there and then send it to whoever you need to send to. Right. Yes. Uh, we're working on making our site more accessible for the city of Tampa. We've talked to uh, a few vendors, AudioEye, um, accessible.net. Are there any that you recommend as far as, you know, because there seems to be some of these organizations that just specialize in this. Um, I would, so it kind of depends. Um, what I would recommend is you want when, you, if, you know, if, especially if you're going to go get a vendor, um, you would want to make sure that that vendor that you're partnering with has specific um, experience working in your industry. So, it, you know, so you're the city of Tampa, your needs might be different than let's say Cornell University. So. You know, while we're all still trying to meet the same, um, you know, the same criterion and um, and all of that, you really want to work with somebody who's used to working with people in your industry. Um, you know, for instance, like let's say you have a lot of PDFs on your website, or if you have a lot of um, multimedia content, you'll need to, and another site doesn't. You might want to work with somebody who has a lot of experience with transcribing, um, you know, your audio content, or you know, they're really good at making sure they ha uh, all your PDFs are accessible and stuff. So I would, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, PDFs. Since you mentioned it, it's a big problem because we, I think we have about thirty-five thousand pages worth of PDFs, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. we're getting quotes like big twelve dollars a page. So it's the biggest headache of my life right now. Yeah. It's and and uh, that's and I will say that's a comment I hear everywhere. People are like, "What the hell do I do with all of my PDFs?" Um, you know, it they do have some checkers online that you can upload a PDF to. Um, if you use, and I think it's only if you have the paid a, a version of Adobe Acrobat, which is which is like kind of annoying. Um, they have an accessibility checker right in there that you can just scan through. Um, and sometimes it, it automatically fixes things for you. Um, you well, know, a lot of cities in Florida have been sued, and some cities in Florida have taken their websites down. I mean, it's 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 a very current issue here. Yeah, New York and Florida, in particular, have the most uh, web accessibility lawsuits, um, I believe. So, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is. You know, if you're in the process of, let's say, converting all of these PDFs and, you, and you're aware that there are problems <laughs> and there might be shortcomings, uh, make it very, very easy for somebody to contact, not just like info at, you know, cityatampa.gov. You're like, 
call this person or email like this person, give a name, you know, have a point of contact and to make it very, very easy. Um, and also make it clear where you are in your accessibility um, initiatives. So it's like, you know, we're aiming by, you know, uh, so-and-so at like 2019 to be fully compliant. Send us feedback if you find anything. Make it very transparent that you're, this is something that you're working on and you're, um, that you're prioritizing, but also you, know, you recognize that your site might not be fully accessible, so give those types of users um, a way to contact you because a lot of web accessibility lawsuits come out of agitated and frustrated users who have like, tried to contact um, you know, a company or an organization and be like, hey, like, I can't do this, and then the company or organization just kind of like shot them down. Yeah. I, I could add to that because we had a complaint about two years ago, um, and there was an investigation, and we did we came up with our plan, and then they had dropped they you know they dropped it for us because they I mean you can't fix it overnight, so I don't I, I won't worry about just a one day I'm sued you know so whatever for whatever that's worth. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're just trying to get a handle on what's the best tool. We, we've been using SwordSight for a couple of years. I don't know if anybody else uses that. Looking at other tools, um, AQA, but... For just PDFs or just for your... For the site in general, yeah. I've been using Monsito. Yeah, that's site that's improve that's is another site. site. I have experience with Site Improve, and I, I personally really like that, um, especially if you're using... Um, they have a really handy extension on your web um, for your web browser that when you click it, you know, because the one thing about the Wave extension is, you know, it highlights the things that are wrong and it's like, you know, but you kind of like have to understand why they're telling you why it's wrong. Um, but the Site Improve extension is really great because it tells you exactly uh, why it's wrong, but also like whose responsibility it is, because sometimes it's a, a designer's responsibility, sometimes it's a content editor's responsibility, and sometimes it's a developer's responsibility. So it breaks it out like that, which is nice. And then also they have like their whole dashboard where they can you can integrate it in your site and stuff. And the, the other thing that we've heard is that the scanning software only catches like 20% of the issues. It's, um, and yeah, it seems well, it's kind of person. There's a lot of things with, with uh, automated accessibility, yeah. and they're not people. And some of these things require human logic mm -hmm. to know if this is a violation or not. Yeah, so but checks. they're good, but they're good for low hanging fruit usually. It's not. And they, like, for instance, they can, you know, one of these automated, um, you know, accessibility tools, they can tell you that an image has alt text but it can't tell you if it's meaningful. Like a lot of people put in like alt text, like image. It's like, okay, like obviously it's a JPEG, it's an image, but like what of? So then, you know, so it will pass you because it's like, oh yeah, it's alt text, but it's not meaningful. So um, anytime, you know, you're auditing a site um, or if you're wondering if you're in compliance or not, it does require um, some type of human interaction with it. And that's the only, I mean, that's, you know, these tools are great and they can test for a lot of things, but you definitely need uh, human interaction, human input through it. So you would need to have the JAWS software installed and run you through your site with that? Is that what you recommend? Um, you can. Um, if you have, um, I mean, if you're using a screen reader and you have um, any type of Apple products, they actually have, um, and then Android phones too, they actually have a, Voice a uh, voiceover app like natively installed. Um, so like so, my computer here it's an Apple as voiceover. So but you can use Jaws. Um, there is also another tool where um, it's created by um, Totally T A T O T A one one Y. And what it does is um, one of their one of their features is a screen reader wand. Um, that so you can like. You know, kind of go through your site with your cursors and instead of it reading out loud to you, you'll see like what the screen reader would um, would would um, speak out to you. Um, but the best advice I could give you is you really want to use real users, um, people who actually you know use these um, types of assistive technologies because the way you or me would use it um, is not the way somebody who actually relies on it would use it. Um, like I, I, use a, I use a screen reader, you know, when I'm doing auditing just to get an idea, but it's like, you know, you put a sheet of paper over here and then I have, um, on that sheet of paper, I have all the commands, because it's, you know, but it takes me very long to go through it because it's not how I interact with the web. So we do have tools for that and you can, I think, to get an idea of like how, um, 
how a screen reader would interpret your site, absolutely go, you know, listen to it one time because you'll pro it'll probably be like really heartbreaking. You'll be like, oh my God, this person has to listen through all of this stuff. I don't have skip links. Like, oh my God, we need to change this. So it's pretty enlightening. Um, but, you know, you'll want to contact like real users. I think the Carroll Foundation for the Blind, um, for instance, they have, um, you can contact them and they can have somebody there go through uh, your site or application with screen readers and stuff. Um, certain universities also provide that type of service. Um, any more questions? Yeah, well, class dismissed them. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, feel free to come by our booth um, and we can talk about accessibility. I also have some cards up here if anybody wants to.